So let me, g I'll give you a little bit of background of who I am and uh, just to give you some context, uh, you, my name, you know, already know. I'm the Dean at the Seaman College of Business and I have been here, just, I'm just finishing six years as the Dean and I moved here from Minnesota where I was at a similar type of institution, a regional comprehensive as a Dean of a bit their business school uh, for eight years. Prior to that, I was at Saginaw Valley as an endowed chair in international business. And prior to that, I was at the University of Maine as a faculty member. University of Maine is like Michigan State, the land grant, but it's smaller because Maine is such a small state compared to Michigan. So uh, my academic background is marketing and international business. And here I still do teach. I teach leading change and I teach emerging trends in our executive MBA programs. So that's pretty much what I've done. I, I had done a good amount of international travel. I've taught internationally, lived internationally a little bit. Um, and, and so uh, my, my background and my way of doing things is always thinking about the future and thinking about how we can do things differently to move forward and to make things better as opposed to just staying as we've always been. Um, I, I'll give, I, I actually like to know what you all do before I talk. Would you mind if you introduce yourselves a little bit to me? I mean, you, you, you came on this to just listen, but I, I really would rather have it a conversation. Yes, this is Barbara Welch and, um, I am a, a business owner um, here in Grand Rapids. Um, I do business development and real estate uh, development. Um, I am also a uh, consultant with GROW for the Empower Her program. Thank you, Barbara. The name of my business is Inheritance Development. I'm sorry. Thanks. Nice to be here. Mary? Yes, this is Mary Dykstra, owner of within reach organizing services and i am a business owner for 20 years and i am a certified professional organizer clearing the clutter out of my clients minds and environments so they can focus on what they need to but i also have a space where i do residential work and helping people move and so being within people's spaces and touching their things um, right now during COVID is, is of great concern and it is to our industry. So I'm very interested to hear what you see as coming down the pike for people who are very interactive with other folks. Thank you. Natasha? And that I confused people, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I am a family home daycare provider and I'm licensed with the state of Michigan. And I've been doing it for almost five years now and that's what I do. Great, thank you. Josephine? I'm hi, my name is Josephine White. I can't read. Um, hi. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Josephine White. Uh, I am a licensed cosmetologist and I also own I've been a salon owner for six years. I own JoJo's House of Beauty. Um, and I also have my own hair care line which is JoJo's Hair Essence. Mm. Oh, great. Are you open now? I am. We've been open since June 15th. That's great to hear. So um, all of your businesses have been um, impacted by all of this in one way or another, I would take, I take it. So I'm Absolutely. gonna, I, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna just give you a little bit of economic background to give you a bigger picture of what the state looks like and what it looks like relative to the rest of the country. Um, and my, I, the data that I am going to use has come from the Wall Street Journal as well as from uh, our in-house economist at, at Seedman. His name is Paul Isley. And if you, have, if you see different kinds of economic outlook, presentations done uh, in West Michigan, many times Paul is the one that is doing those economic outlooks. He's a, but he's, I, I, I fondly refer to him as our data geek, and I really appreciate having someone like that. But, but the news is really sobering. The data is really sobering about Michigan, and this is not the first time that Michigan has faced some of these economic issues. If we go back to 2008, uh, we were in pretty bad shape relative to the rest 
of the country. So in May, and economic data is always that there's always a lag, but in May, Michigan had the third largest unemployment rate in the country at 21.2%. Uh, and the only two states that were behind us were Nevada and Hawaii. And both of those were as low as they were, as have been, is because they are huge tourism in the, uh, tourism destinations. And a lot of, a very large proportion of their economy comes from tourism. For us, it was manufacturing. Manufacturing really slowed down to almost nothing in some cases, and in other cases, they managed, they could maintain some work uh, operations because they were essential work. So, so that's where we started in May. Um, and April was very similar that we were above 20% in unemployment. Among the count, the count, uh, among the counties, among the countries, our countries, top 50 counties for unemployment in April. Okay, so if we think about all of the counties across the country and their unemployment rates, the top 50 with the highest unemployment rates of those counties, 32 of them, 32 of 50 were in Michigan. So that puts us at a very, at, at, at a high proportion of unemployment and pockets of unemployment. Muskegon County was one of the hardest hit counties. Uh, from COVID, Michigan also recorded the eighth highest rate of deaths per 1,000 people uh, because of COVID. So we're starting at a pretty low level uh, or a, a low economic level even though we've had one of the most stringent stay-at-home social distancing policies in the country. The, the good news is, and I'm gonna try and put, I'm gonna try and share a screen just to show you a graph, and I don't know if this is gonna work, but we'll see. Share screen. Okay. And then go. Can you see that? Yep, we can see it. Oh, good. Okay. So this shows continuing unemployment claims in Michigan. The blue line is continuing claims. Um, the orange line is the claims in the first half of 2009. So think back to the 2008 uh, economic downturn. And then the gray line at the very bottom is the average over the last seven years. I'm not including this year. So you can see that unemployment uh, is starting to decline if you look at the dates, the blue line. So June, uh, right now it's over, still over 20%. Uh, June, when they get the numbers done for this month, it will likely fall to about 13 or four, 13 to 14%. In July, it's on track to drop to 7 to 10%. We have to put that into context. What the with think about what the unemployment rate was in was in Michigan, especially West Michigan, in February. It was down around three percent in some cases, less than three in some counties, and a little bit more than three in other counties. So Muskegon County was at three point eight, almost four percent, prior to um, COVID. They expect, and so I'm gonna take this down, I just wanted to show it to you. There we are. Uh, they expect that in July, most likely those gains, the continued gains in unemployment will slow down because a lot of this is being propped up by the CARES Act, by, P by the CARES Act and PPA, PPP, in terms of the, the unemployment that people are receiving for not working right now. And that's this scheduled to end in July, unless the government does extend it. And if that's the case, most likely there will be people who are now on furlough, who think that they will be going back to a job and those jobs may not be there because the economy is not recovering as quickly as people would hope. And as we stay in phase four, 
we still have two more phases after phase four to get the economy open all the way up. What our economists are saying, what their, their best guess right now is that we will remain at phase four through, through the fall, or at least through the beginning of the fall. And that, that will slow down our ability to reinvigorate and, and start up the economy again. Um, on the positive side of all of this is that, uh, that uh, individuals, disposable income has increased by 13% compared to last year. Much of that is because of the PPP, the uh, increased uh, amounts people are getting in unemployment. In many cases, as, as we talk to employers, they are struggling. Those that have opened up manufacturers and packaging people and pharma and different industries, they're struggling to get workers because workers are making more on unemployment than they would make if they went back to work. On the other side of that, we also hear from employers saying, even though some people are, would make more on unemployment, they want to come back to work because they want to be doing something and they want to be contributing. So we have, we have both. And we don't know the proportionality of, of them, but those are two, two components that, that um, add into trying to figure out what the future is going to look like. For our savings rate, our savings rate hit 33% of individuals and that's high. I don't have anything to compare that to, but it's gone, it's, it has increased as a result. Part of that is people haven't been able to get out and spend money. Another part is that people are so are uncertain. And when there's a lot of uncertainty, they don't, they, they, they curtail their spending for things that are not absolutely necessary. Um, the longer we stay in stage four, the longer that will last, I think because until we really open up, people are, are not going to be as comfortable not having uh, um, a fallback, a buffer to a safety net, so to speak, in, in terms of savings. So um, what's gonna happen in the economy moving forward? It's really hard to tell. The other thing that is starting to happen as we look around the country, as the states have started to open up, there, there have been substantial increases in the number of COVID cases around the country. And we have to look at that, and we have to look at that objectively. Because if we think about COVID and the reason that we closed down the state or the country was closed down, the world was closed down, was not to get eliminate to be able to eliminate the virus. It was to allow the healthcare systems and other important systems, the, the supply chain systems for healthcare, to be able to figure out how to manage and treat the, the illness as opposed to eliminating it. And it won't be eliminated until there's a vaccine. And in many cases, vaccines don't always eliminate. But if we look at what our healthcare systems have done, and they've done a phenomenal job, Spectrum, Mercy, and Metro, all of them have been phenomenal in terms of the quick learning they've done over a very short period of time to figure out how to manage this. And they are all pretty confident right now that if there is an upsurge, they will be able to manage the number of cases. What they're finding is the, a large percentage of the cases are in young people. So I was just reading something this morning uh, from Texas, and Texas had, uh, has had a big uptick. And almost 50% are in people 20 to 30 years old. So we are starting to see that in a number of states we're starting to see it in michigan which is why i think one of the reasons the governor has extended stage four at least through the middle of july which makes a heck of a lot of sense because july 4th this is going to be our test our big test to see what happens after july 4th and you wait two weeks until after july 4th to see and, and normally you don't really need two weeks the symptoms start showing within two to five days to see what kind of increase there's been, there have been. And, and the bump that happened last week 
the, it can be a good proportion of that can be targeted to um, a few bars around the state that that uh, many young people frequent. So we have to look at it as a way to we have to figure out how to manage and and guide people in terms of social distancing and in terms of what do you do if somebody is tested positive for it and and that has to become part of how we normally work not be afraid of it but figure out a plan and be be flexible enough to understand that that plan might change so the, the i think one of the best things to always think about is the what if what if it's this what if it's this what if it's this not just one way of doing things but at least three best case worst case most likely and continuously revisit that because that is how we are that's how we can deal with uncertainty and the one thing i think we know for certain for the next several months is if things will be uncertain so that's that's the economic background of, of what what we see in terms of the michigan economy it's going to take us some time to get out of this this is we're not going to be back to three percent unemployment or four percent unemployment in a half a year or a year if we look at the state and the state budget hole as a result of covid the, the tax base how many people have been driving a lot how many times have you all filled your cars with gas in the last three months i've done it twice because i had to had to go to a couple of places um, but I talk to people who've done it maybe once or, or haven't haven't filled their cars tanks with gas at all. So that's a huge tax loss for us, as well as the fact that we're not buying many things uh, at retail and, and other places other than food and essentials. So they are expecting that the tax, I think they're expecting this round a $2 billion tax hole a two billion dollar general fund or state loss and and they expect it not to be the only one that we will have so they're looking two to five years is is what we are hearing could be less could be more but think about how long it took us to get out of to the 2008 economic decline it wasn't until 2013 that we were back to back, back even to where we were prior to 2008 So what else would you like to know? Or what, does this raise any questions? Um, do we wave our hand or can we just speak? Either. Well, I was, I was watching the news and I just want to make sure this was correct. They said that there was three states that they're going to, if you've been, you've been traveling to those three states, you're going to have to quarantine for two weeks. And they're reaching out to these people by their air flight. And if they don't quarantine and they find out it's going to be a fine, I want to just know the states. I believe it was, they didn't say this. I, they probably did, but I didn't hear it. I think it was Arizona, Texas, and Florida. Do you know? I don't know, but I do know that Florida was one of the early states that had an increase yeah. in the, the virus in Texas. Mm -hmm. is is now um, having experiencing an increase and what was the third one you said i believe Arizona. i believe it's florida but then i heard some about minnesota and missouri so the pre the governor andrew Cuomo, new york he announced this on cnn and i was watching it but i didn't catch the three states and he so, said uh, go ahead go ahead he what said three northeast states require travelers to self quarantine. I'm so yeah, <laughs> this is being recorded, huh? So <laughs> how think about this? Now Minnesota has had an increase too. Minnesota yeah. has had a, a number of issues uh, even before the the death of Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, but they had a number of issues with with quarantining not quarantining and making decisions about covid and had a lot of controversy so there but there's there in minnesota the number of cases are still comparatively low to many other states 
Yes. So I, 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 my big question is how in the world are they going to monitor and manage who goes in and out of that state? Are they, how, how, can you, how can you control borders within right. a country between cities and states? I don't know how, I don't know how they'll do it. But I think if people just use good judgment, it would be uh, probably a lot easier. I, it'll be hard to quarantine. It'll be yeah. really difficult to do that. Mary, were you going to ask something? Yes, I was. Thank you. Um, my question is, we're in phase four, and I'm not versed enough to know what phase five and six are. So what what is still being really dampened that is going to be affecting us in the next few months before five and six open up? Yeah, I um, things like gyms, gymnasiums, or gy workout places, I think the, the governor was going to allow those to open on Monday. And I don't know if she's going to push that back or not. Uh, and there are some other things that aren't open completely. I'd have to, I, I don't have it off the top of my head. I would have to look it up. But her, her entire executive order and all of what is included in each of the phases is on the government website. If you, right. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that still the churches are not supposed to be gathering inside with more than 100 people. Is that right? Or 250 that, or something? That is true. So, so right now, phase four and phase five would shorten the social distance and not, and not require. Uh, so right now, I think we still can only have gatherings of 10. The next step is gatherings of a little bit bigger. So if you think about hospitality and you think about how we all work and having different kinds of meetings or events and bringing a lot of people together, uh, that will be delayed in, in our ability to do those kinds of things. Yeah. Like, so fairs and all those yeah. things. Were so, think, so think about, think about the tourism industry in Michigan in winter, winter, in summer and fall. Fall is a huge time. Summer is even bigger. And most of that is, is not going to happen this year. And more and more events later in the fall are going to be canceled over the next couple of months if we don't have a clear uh, direction. Okay. I'm gonna pop in if that's okay. And Barbara typed in a question. Um, and it says, what is the economic impact of the protest and potential boycotts? It will exacerbate the downward trend in, in the economy because I, it will keep people away. It'll bring some people in and keep other people away. It is negative. In, if you look at downtown uh, Grand Rapids where there has been some damage from some of the protests, it will, uh, those, those businesses have an even bigger economic impact, negative impact, having to repair their, their businesses, close them for a while and things like that. The other, another uh, out, possible outcome is that people will just kind of quarantine or sequester themselves even more. And then there's the costs of all of the, um, Community organ to community organizations, community uh, um, community groups, not groups, but things like the police, fire, uh, safety, and and those costs. There will be increased costs as, uh, as a result of it. it. It'll make it more difficult for us all to work together, unfortunately. And just two other notes here in the chat. Latasha says, I was told 100 for gatherings from governor in Michigan. So 10 mm -hmm. now. Yep, I think again, we're, we should just reference that um, executive order. My understanding, it may be 100 outside, 10 inside. Um, I yeah. think there's a different number for indoor versus outdoor. But again, I think that executive order is gonna be the best resource for that question. Um, and then Barbara again said, can you provide highlights for the major industries? I'm not sure, Barbara, if you can unmute and maybe explain a little bit more um, what you were asking with that. Um, 
Yes, I was in the chat. I'm sorry. Um, right, just some of the major industries like uh, uh, real estate, um, transportation, um, some of those, you know, the, the, the bigger industries. I know you mentioned um, the oil and gas industry a little bit when you spoke of uh, just the low purchase rate by consumers. Um, but I, you know, I'd like to I understand you're, you know, not going to be able to speak to every industry, but uh, maybe some of the major industries. It would be so interesting major, to hear about. A couple of the industries in the state, uh, of course, is auto is, is our, our biggest. And it already over the last two to three years had been seeing major declines in auto sales. And those were expected to continue. And many of the auto companies over the last couple of years have been closing plants and they've been downsizing the number of the number of models, the different types of cars and trucks and models that they produce across the country and across the world. And they have been consolidating and rationalizing. So um, yeah, I wish I knew more about car brands, but GM and Christ GM closed a number of plants. Ford has closed a number of plants around the country and they've stopped many of the car, car manufacturers have stopped making cars, sedans, and they are focusing primarily on SUVs and trucks. And so already they had been uh, experiencing some economic, some negative economic impact. And uh, because fewer people are driving, if you look at the millennials, fewer of them have licenses than any of the other generations before proportionally. The different uh, car services or travel services like Uber uh, have replaced them, plus the autonomous vehicles and, and things like that are starting to, had started to take, take a bigger portion of the market. So they, had, they were already in a downturn and they were one of the first uh, industries to really close a lot of what they did because it was non-essential. You have to remember the governor closed all non-essential activities. And so some of it, it was very bare bones. And, and so they have been hurt quite a bit, but it really was just exacerbating something that had already started. There were, there are too many car companies across the world, too many cars across the world. And as a result, the rationalization had already started and this is just going to make it um, a, a lot faster. The furniture industry, another one of the big industries in, in the state, it, they were down to about 25% production. And that was of es essential products because furniture companies make things for healthcare. They make things for other companies that needed to stay working. They just, in talking with some people from some of them, they are just getting back to 100%. Some of the other companies are, um, so we talked about manufacturer car manufacturers. A lot of the companies in West Michigan supply the car industry, auto industry. And many of them are, are connected worldwide. And so when, when borders were closed, it, it changed, it disrupted the supply chains. So people could, so companies couldn't get all the pieces that they needed and in the proper timing and things like that. So there was a pretty good sized downturn in that. And, and um, those companies have started to ramp back up. Some of them are, are doing fairly well, others not, not as well. And unfortunately, the smaller companies are the ones that suffer, have suffered the most because they didn't have the liquidity needed the big, the big issue about move, about main surviving through all of this is liquidity. Did you ha did they have enough money, enough cash, to hold them over for the number of weeks and months until they could get back to work? Uh, and small businesses tended not to have that. And of course, the biggest industry that's been hurt is is the hospitality industry. 
uh, and it is not expected to come back full, to full uh, level that it was pre-COVID for a long, long time, and most likely will look very different. Pharma has pharmaceuticals have continued to to do well. So um, one business owns a, a few different companies doing different things. One of them is packaging for uh, for pills, packages, pills, and, and things like that. His work, his, the demand was up, up, above the roof. The de demand just was very, very high. His biggest challenge was getting people to work because being furloughed, they were making more money than they would make if they were working. So it, it, it goes across a number of industries. The real estate industry, real estate, com commercial real estate, I think has, uh, has, has big risks right now because what we see happening, and as I talk to different business leaders, they, they and, and what I read uh, is that they are realizing they don't have to have everybody together in the same place to do their work. And they, that people are just as efficient and sometimes more efficient in getting their work done working remotely than having to commute to a single place and all be together and and work so you go down someone uh someone had come back from chicago and he said another, another business leader and he said walking down michigan ave in chicago and looking at all of the big corporate buildings completely empty with no no activity at all he said it was just so unusual and eerie, but that could become the future. What will, what will our workspaces look like? Some of you work from your home, right? Or, or, yeah, so it's what you do normally. Is, is that what's going to happen to corporate America? Um, and that still remains to be seen. A lot of people who have been working from home really like it. Others are climbing the walls to get out because they like the socialization. So where do we find a balance? I don't see us going back to the way we were in February. And I'm not, and I'm, I'm, that probably in my mind is a good thing because we become pretty complacent in our job processes, in the work processes and what we do. And when we become too complacent in, in our businesses, we, we miss opportunities for innovation and looking at new ways to do things. Yeah, I agree, Barbara. I don't, I don't business as usual is, I, I don't, business as usual, I think is, is going to be dangerous for us. And if we look at the rest of the world, um, I wonder what's going to happen to globalization right now. And, and what's really interesting is many companies have always, when, when you have a supply chain and you have to get different parts from different places, many companies had single source suppliers. They didn't even have a backup. And so when that single source couldn't deliver because the borders were closed or for whatever reason, they didn't know where to go. And that's part of our complacency is that we, we find something that's really comfortable. And I, I see West Michigan like this. So I, I remember I've been here for six years and none of you really know me, but I'm usually pretty, I'm, I grew up in New York state, central New York. And, and um, people always say New Yorkers are a little too direct. So um, I've always been kind of direct, but I think we're, we, we in West Michigan like, the status quo and want everybody to follow rules and we don't want to to upset the apple cart so to speak i think we need to upset the apple cart we need to look at different ways of doing things and be more innovative or we we may not be able to maintain our competitive positions we have a few chats over in the box uh, josephine says that yes the beauty industry has been um, certainly changed throughout all of this. Um, and I think it continues to change and will forever change. Um, Barbara has another question. She says, how has farming been impacted? And 
um, as they continue to harvest or start to harvest those summer food crops. So um, for Barbara, for your question, I don't know how farming has been, how it has been impacted. I know in, on the bigger scale, I don't know locally on the bigger scale, farmers, some farmers have lost a lot of uh, revenue because they haven't had the workers to harvest in other parts of the state of the country where their harvest, their cycle is different. So they could plant a lot earlier and they could start harvesting. Uh, like California and places like that where it's almost year round. Here, we might not, it may not be as bad because our harvest season is so, is later in, in the year and we are opening up a little bit. The big issue will be whether or not they can find people to work and help them. Josephine, um, how, I'm, I'm curious. Josephine has, uh, has the hair salon, right? Yes. yes. How have you yep. had to change what you do? Um, well, <laughs> we have, um, we require everybody to wear masks that enter the salon. Um, we have a sanitation station as soon as you walk in and then we have you wash your hands before your service. So as soon as you walk in, you go to the sanitation station, you go to the bathroom, you wash your hands and then we direct you to our station. The blessing part is my salon, um, each station has its own shampoo bowl. So we're pretty much like six feet apart. Like there's a barrier in between each station. Um, so I have six stations. Um, we have to book out an extra 15 minutes so that we can sanitize like in between each client. We use a new cape for each client. Um, so it's a lot of towels, a lot of loads <laughs> going into the washing machine. Um, it's just, it, we usually do, I mean, as an owner, I'm doing about four to five clients a day, um, which is probably less than what I've done before COVID. I usually do, I used to do like seven or eight people. So we pretty much cut our clientele in half. Um, you know, it's just trying to stay consistent and in wearing a mask. We both wear masks during the service, the client and myself and my team. It's, it's different. Yeah. And it's not easy to wear a mask all day. No, it's very difficult. Not at all. And and so did somebody come in and inspect what you did or did you have to send in a plan somewhere to get it okayed? How how does the state know you're following the rules? So I think it's pretty much as an owner, I've set my own standards for my salon. Um, I was actually on the team with Laura to come up with an eight-pillar plan to present to Governor Gretchen. Um, on how we how we plan on opening up, um, you know, the salon industry. So I was able to kind of be on the forefront of that with the group of other stylists and Laura, the Laura team. Um, so I was able to kind of contribute to that. But, you know, it's I've always kept my salon clean, but this just made us take it like to another level. And they actually had interviewed me. I was on the news um, for Wood TV 8 in Grand Rapids and kind of just showed like we have signs everywhere. So I think as an owner, you have to um, set the standard and just hold your team accountable to it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Latasha, you, you put a note in there that a lot of your clients are keeping their kids home. You're on mute. Some parents are and some are not, but I happened, one good thing, I had all essential parents from the beginning and all of them was subsidy, meaning they get, um, they get mo their money from like state, like DHS. I did have one cash parent, she decided to just up and quit when it started. She just quit her job too, which was essential. So I took that loss, but thank you, thank God I say. The other ones was all subsidy. So thank you to governor. She allowed, even if the kids wasn't coming or not, she allowed me to get paid until this was all over. And that helped me financially because I would have to do the unemployment thing and you know how that's working with some people. So, so, and then some parents, they just, you know, they still kind of leery about COVID. So they're keeping their kids home. And then some are just, extending the unemployment until they can can't 
you know, get paid anymore and then deciding to come back. But like, I still had, um, like far as when the pandemic, I was having my parents stay outside like six feet away. Um, they had to wear masks. Um, if my kids go on outings, which wasn't much of an outing, we maybe one day went to the track, the essential parents, because I stayed open for essential parents when this happened. And then um, the temperature check, I started doing that when they start opening back up. And um, they wash their hands, all kids when they come in. And then we have a, our website had a plan where we could implement. They did it for us, but we just can add on the opening of the daycare. So that was nice. So I did mine already and it's ready to go. But it's, it's, it's a little difficult, you know. And one thing about me, I didn't do all three shifts, which is great because, you know, you got to clean each shift. So I only do day shift, and then I have a capacity of six kids only. So that helped me out. Were you allowed to take on more different new clients during this? I was told I could, well, when the, when, essential only. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And we have another person, Sarah. Yes, Sarah joined us just hey. a few minutes late. Yeah, sorry about that. I was I was in another meeting that that went over. Hold on, I can turn on my video. I was just typing something to everybody. Oh, there we go. Would you introduce yourself? Oh, way down there. Yeah, there you are, buddy. <laughs> go ahead and I'm just so share a little bit about yourself, there, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, my name is Sarah Hall. I own the Griswold Group. We are a small employee benefits insurance agency. So we have been on the ground working long days since all of this started, um, working with our employers who are just concerned about all the things that we're talking about. And uh, yeah, we were very lucky for the fact that we could go remotely really quickly and have been able to do that. We're very grateful for that piece of it. Um, but I also, what I was starting to type is, um, I do have an HR resource that we give to all of our clients, which I would be more than happy to share with anybody who might need it. Um, no strings attached, no nothing, just extra access. It's a whole section on COVID and then there's also a legally backed question. You can call or type in a question and you'll get an answer um, from an HR professional just to kind of help small businesses navigate through this. What do I have to do? The employee asked me this. You know, how do I handle this? Um, those kind of things, because it's different and we're all facing some different things. So. Thank you, that's great. So Barbara, you have business development, right? How is your yes, business? And, and real estate. Um, I am also a, a real estate developer in the residential field. And um, I had just typed in a comment um, that, you know, what I have noticed, you know, I, I feel that because it is an essential industry uh, that it will stabilize. Uh, but I think what um, COVID has uh, really done um, as it relates to residential real estate, um, it has made home even more important. And, um, and so I think that families and, you know, individuals that um, are looking to buy homes or make those improvements. Um, I think it just um, is even more crucial um, in this environment. You know, many uh, people are working from home remotely, uh, so they, you know, want to have a home that has a designated office space, and they just want home to be more attractive and um, maybe willing to kind of stretch more to get that home because now the home is the you know the 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 restaurant dining room because you have to order in and um, even as you start having family over because you can't be out in public like we were so I'm I'm, I'm hopeful um, I do have um, homes that will be hitting the market um, later this summer and um, I you know just in the conversations that I'm having with brokers uh, to begin to market those homes, uh, we, we are, we remain hopeful. 
and as far as the business development um, piece, it's been, you know, I have enjoyed um, talking with clients as they work through, move through COVID um, and, you know, making the transitions. We're, you know, we are resilient as business owners and I would, I would like to add as women business owners. And so it has been uh, very encouraging to see how they've been able to navigate and come out um, successful. And uh, my hope is that they will continue to be able to do that. That's great. Yes, apparently the sales of freezers went through the roof over the last few months and other, other home appliances or, or items to make your homes uh, more comfortable as Barbara was talking about, as well as home office. So the, off the furniture companies, they've had a big uh, an uptick in, in home office furniture as opposed to um, as opposed to in a in a commercial site. And Mary, your your business of organization, uh, I assume the the well what what's happened with it? Well I I was part of the stay at home crowd. Um, so I was in lockdown with everybody else and I'm starting to come out. I've got clients who are calling and new clients who are calling, but you know, I look at the things that I work with a lot of vulnerable populations. So I will work with the elderly or somebody who's got physical disabilities so that I can physically do the work for them or mental disabilities or just whatever. So, you know, mine are the basic concerns. When I go in, I do ask them about what their health status is and if they've been traveling. But I go in whether they think it's necessary or not with gloves and masks and, you know, a lot of washing up. But, you know, my concern is, is that we've got family coming in over the holiday weekend and they're going to be flying and they're going to go through a couple of big airports. So then my question to myself and my clients is we're having people in where the assumption is everybody's fine, but I'm very willing to self quarantine for two weeks because, you know, they're coming in from other communities and some of those communities might have higher COVID. So am I going to be keeping myself in and out of quarantine that, you know, that's the big dance right now trying to figure that. And that, that's a good, good point to bring up because I think that's what's going to happen over the entire fall and who knows if it will go on, go beyond that, but it's contact, contact tracing is tough. But as we become, we interact with more and more people, some of them will become, um, infected with COVID. They'll test positive. They might not get very sick. They might get And then what do we do? We have to quarantine those people. Do we have to quarantine ourselves? Those kinds of decisions are going to be almost daily decisions for some people depending on, on their um, industry, on their business. So, so Josephine with, with a beauty salon, what if one of your, pet, your customers calls you three days after be, after seeing you and saying, I've come down with the symptoms for COVID. What are you going to do? Having that in prepared, it, that scenario, thinking it out will be really, really important for any of you who are still are interacting with the public. Latasha La, La, La with, with the children and, and, and parents, especially essential parents if they're in high risk areas, you will have the same kind of challenge and some and others will as well. For us at the university, we are going to have 20,000 plus students coming back. And, um, and they, no matter how, how much we talk to them, they're gonna do what they want outside of classes. We can protect them in, 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 in the, on campus, but we can't protect them outside of campus. So we expect that students will be coming in and out of classes and they'll be out for two weeks because they have to quarantine because they were with someone who, who con contracted the, the, the virus or they did. And, and so it's going to keep everything in a lot of flux in terms of how we do our business. So the biggest piece of advice I can give anyone is always stay nimble, stay agile and don't, assume you know what to expect tomorrow because it might be different. Right. One other thing I want to mention um, is that we, we at, at Seedman, we, um, as part of all of, all of this, uh, we have the SBDC, the Small Business Development Center, is, 
is housed. It, we host them. And we host the state office as well as the West Region office. We have the Van Andel Global Trade Center, and they have been deal, they've been working with companies around the state to help them figure out what to do with their broken supply chains and importing and things like that. And many of our students go out and have internships during the summer, spring, summer academic year with companies, and companies just stopped all of that. So we, we created some opportunities for our students to gain some experience and to use their technical expertise that they've learned in, in, in their coursework. We have a program a con where we have student consulting projects, and I believe we are working with GROW is one of our, one of the student, um, community organizations. We're working with GROW, we're working with the Grand Rapids Chamber. The Grand Rapids Chamber was just awarded 25 million dollars for the Kent Recover Small Business Recovery Program. So the Chamber is going to administer that. Uh, we are working with the right place. We're working with the SBDC. SBDC has seen across the state over 6,000 small businesses in the last two and a half months. And normally they don't, they see about 5,000 businesses a year. And so they, sur they surpassed that in a very short period of time. But what we are doing is when, when, come, when small businesses need some technical help, whether it's finance, putting together some financials, putting together a marketing a plan, putting together something with MIS, um, our students will work on projects. So it's something to keep in mind um, if you ever need some help or if um, just talk with Grow, that's our connection. Uh, and and uh, they will be there, and we have faculty that will mentor the students, so so we'll get faculty expertise as well. We're testing it, we're piloting it this summer. We have ten students, and they're working with sixty different companies on different projects to help in some of the small tactical tactical technical areas you might need some help in. <coughs> oh, excuse me, uh, Mary. Mute. Yep. Thank you. Um, one quick question. I'm kind of going off the reservation a little bit, but your thoughts in the future um, with some of the things that Trump has done with the tariffs he's currently talking about and the work visas and cutting those back. How do you think that <coughs> going to so, affect the U.S.? I, the work visas, I haven't really read a lot about that. It just happened a couple of days ago, but it will, it could negatively impact some industries like the high tech uh, and IT industries uh, because we don't have, we don't have the workforce to uh, meet the demands of some of the high tech areas, the industries. The, Tariffs. I, what are, are there? Some new tariffs he's putting on. Yeah, he's talking about with the UK and the European Union, another one point two billion in tariffs across the board. So, so, so using my international business background and, and uh, all of the studying that I've done over the decades, back in the eighties and early nineties, the the U.S. Became, the U.S. started reducing tariffs across the board and continued on that continued on that path for a few decades with the thinking that by opening it people will become more collaborative countries will become more collaborative what it did is it really increased the deficit our trade deficit in terms of we continued to buy more things from other countries we offshored we offshored manufacturing of a lot of products, and this is, this is the problem we have right now, is because we went to other countries to get cheaper products, cheaper inputs and cheaper products, we no longer have the capability of manufacturing a lot of those products. Let's take face masks, ventilators, things like that. We no longer have the technical manufacturing capability that we used to have as a country. And we knew at the time that that was one of the trade-offs and everybody just kind of allowed it to happen because in our country, as people, our focus on the lowest cost product was more important than 
what we um, then our manufacturing base or our workforce base or things like that. And it was more important because it was really all that we knew. We never, we as consumers, I'm talking about us as consumers, we don't necessarily look at the whole supply chain value chain. Most people in the country have no idea where their things come from. They never look at the maiden labels here in the United States. As a result, they just look at the price instead of the maiden labels and make a, an informed decision about do I want do I want to support other countries more than I support manufacturing in my country? Do you know how hard it is to find things? I, I, I can't go into the office because I don't have a thermometer yet to take my temperature. We're doing pre-screening. So I just offered, I just ordered one online because I can't find them in the stores. Um, I could not find anything made in the United States. Nothing. Look at your computers, look at your shoes, look at most of the clothes you have on. And you will find that everything is made someplace else. And then you start to think about all the money. Every time we buy something that's made somewhere else, guess where the money's going? It's going back to that country. So from an academic perspective, what Trump is doing is he's trying to level the playing field. Is he doing it well? I'm not going to judge that one way or the other. As a dean of a business school, I sit on the fence and I, I try not to get on either side of the political, the, the, in the political um, arena because I think that's not, I don't think that's my role to influence students one way or the other politically, but I can tell them about, about the academic side or the theoretical side of all of this. He's trying, he's trying to balance, balance the playing field so that we can bring more jobs back here to the United States. And that is what's happening. Many companies in all of this said, you know, maybe we should bring some of this, this manufacturing back. Maybe we should bring some of this back. And now we have a new NAFTA agreement, USMCA, that was in the middle of all of this. It was, it just started a few weeks ago. Uh, so we have, we had now have um, a solid trade agreement, uh, an extension with, with US, uh, Canada, and Mexico. So that the theories go on and on, but I I I don't the H one B visas will hurt in some cases and not in others, and the tariffs are simply another step of his trying him trying to balance the trade deficit that we have, and it's huge. It's huge. We import way more than we export. Thank you. I think that about concludes our time. Does anyone have any last minute questions for Dean Lawson while we have her? I know it's been a really wonderful conversation. I know I've enjoyed it. Um, so I will just put that out there. Any last minute questions before we all part ways? Or, com or, or uh, suggestions for me? Comments, questions, statements of the day? I just thank you for the conversation. It was really good. <laughs> Good. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. I would add that it was great. I, you know, I love that you um, engaged all of us. That was very great facilitation. <laughs> great. I'm glad to hear that. Thanks. Thank I enjoyed you meeting you all and chatting with you. Good luck yes. in your business. Thank you all. And as a reminder, this will be up on Grow's YouTube page. So feel free to reference it or if you have a friend who might um, enjoy it as well. But otherwise, I think we'll sign off for the day.